This episode of the Golf Guru Show is brought to you by EnviedHemp.com. As golfers, you know the game creates wear and tear on your body and mind. Enveed CBD products can organically rejuvenate you. They come in three varieties, relief, clarity, and relax. Relief CBD products help relieve pain. Clarity allows you to focus on those critical shots. And relaxed CBD products are for those anxious golf moments. Right now, I've got an incredible special for you. Go to EnviedHemp.com and use the promo code GURU20 for a 20% discount for life. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise. You're like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it. Now let's do this. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Golf Guru Show. I'm your host, Jason Sutton, and I'm the guru, where it is my job to interview high performers in the teaching and coaching world, as well as all fields of study. Get them to share their best practices, book ideas, daily habits, and stories that have made them all successful. Make sure you download this episode and all the previous episodes of the Golf Guru Show and subscribe so that you don't miss any upcoming shows as they drop. Okay, this is a big one. I am so excited about my next guest as he is a legend in the teaching game, Mr. Jim McLean. His bio is very extensive, so I'll just hit some of the highlights and we bring up a few of his many positions and accomplishments during the interview. But Jim is the CEO of the Jim McLean Golf School in Biltmore Forest in Miami, Florida, but also has several other locations around the world. Aside from his many playing accomplishments, as he played in several U.S. Opens and the Masters as an amateur. He has worked with countless tour players, such as Keegan Bradley, Gary Woodland, but also Tom Kite, Christy Kerr, and Lexi Thompson, among many others. Aside from his many Teacher of the Year awards, I am most impressed by the amount of Hall of Fames that he's in. The Pacific Northwest Hall of Fame, the Met PGA Hall of Fame, the South Florida PGA Hall of Fame, the Miami Sports Hall of Fame, and the Long Island Hall of Fame, and then most importantly, he was inducted into the World Teachers Hall of Fame. I have to admit that this was probably the most nervous that I've been during an interview, and after doing 90 of these things, you'd think I would be more comfortable, but it's just because of the massive respect that I have for Jim and what he has meant to my career and to so many others, uh, but he couldn't have been more gracious with his time as we got in almost an hour before he had to go. So hopefully we can do another part two at some point because I had so many more questions to cover. We all as coaches owe legends like Jim a huge amount of gratitude for paving the way for us to make a living to do what we love to do. So we cover a lot in this conversation from some of his early influences, some great stories about Jackie Burke, Ken Venturi, and Harry Lighthorse Cooper, to what he has learned in the new age of technology and much, much more. So I hope you enjoy this awesome conversation with the great Mr. Jim McLean. Enjoy. Jim McLean, welcome to the show, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Well, it's good to be with you, Jason. I just wanted to start in maybe a little bit of a different place than most podcasts. I wanted to first you know, say how, how much of a, a huge influence you've been in, in my career as a coach and take you back a little bit about 19 years ago when we first met you know you don't remember this but I just started at Dana Raider I just started teaching full-time and decided to come to a two-day teaching workshop that you put on and you and your staff uh, I think it was 2001 2002 and it just had such a huge effect on my coaching because I was basically sort of just getting into teaching a lot and you know, it's it, oftentimes I think when we receive information, it's like we've got to be ready for it, right? So it's it was in a great time in my career to like basically spur my curiosity 
on to really trying to get better as a coach. And it also sort of opened my eyes to a different way of teaching because at that time, you know, sort of before cell phones and a lot of the technology that we have nowadays is you were just using video. And at the time that was really a, that was all the technology that we had. That was really, we were high tech. You had the super station going. Uh, I met so many of uh, my really good friends today, just from that one workshop, Jason Carbone, Kevin Sprecker, Michael Hunt, you know, Robert Campbell, all these guys that I'm really good friends with now. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And then also sort of lead into some of your influences, because I know you've had so many and I've basically stalked your career and, and, and really uh, admired everything that you've done in your career. So I'm just going to throw out a couple of names that back in the early days had an influence on you. And we can kind of go with that. The first one is Jackie Burke. Like, tell me a little bit about Jackie Burke and then what you learned from him. Well, I went to the University of Houston uh, for college, and uh, one of the guys on my team was a member at Champions, so that helped a lot. When you made the team at Houston, you could play some of the great places in Houston. One of them was Champions, and I got to meet Jackie early on in my life, probably when I was, I really got to know him when I was 18, 19, and then we played a few times, so Jackie Burke is uh, for those who don't know, was the leading money winner on the PGA Tour, won the Masters in the PGA. He's had a huge in- influence on teaching a lot of great players. For example, Jack Nicklaus credits him with his putting. Uh, Crenshaw a lot with his putting. Uh, Mickelson spent a lot of time with Jackie, just to name a few, but he played on five Ryder Cup teams. And he was great friends with Ben Hogan. So when Hogan came down to Houston, he'd come down every week to be with Jimmy Demerit who was his partner. Demerit won the Masters three times. And uh, Hogan would come down. So whenever that happened, uh, I'd get a little notice, and I'd go out and watch Hogan play in practice, which was, you know, great. And yeah. then Jackie, oh, through the years, we did a lot, of, a lot of schools together. When I was in New York, he would come up at my different clubs when I was a head professional up there, and then out to PGA West and to Doral. And, you know, we stay in touch all the time and he's just a very smart guy jason he's just a very knowledgeable guy and you know he's run the race he kind of got me started on you know the ideas that stand the test of time yeah i think and one of the one of my favorite stories that i've heard you tell a few times and i actually use as a as a tip was the or the the idea that he gave you when you ask him about hitting the tee shot at the Masters when you played the Masters as an amateur. Can you share that story? Because I think it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> well, there's a few of them. Uh, the, the quick one was I asked him, you know, for an idea on that first tee shot, and he said, take the longest backswing of your life. <laughs> and like a normal thing with Jackie, I didn't really, it didn't comprehend really what that meant. So he always would kind of ask or wait for you to respond. And I said, well, you know, why would I do that? And he said, so you could get the club at least halfway back. <laughs> and that was uh, that was great. a good one. Yeah. And then I had one other ones where he, he told me to go down to Galveston and hit the three balls into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, which is a long story. But I ended up doing that. And and uh, I, when I saw him a few weeks later in, at Champions, I told him, Mr. Burke, I went to, you know, I did what you said. And, and he said, well, what was that? And he said, well, I... I went down to I drove down to Galveston, which is 50 miles away, and <laughs> he hit those balls in the Gulf. And he said, "Well, great. What did you learn?" And I said, "Well, I didn't learn anything really. I don't <laughs> know. I don't know what I was supposed to learn." He, and he said, "How'd you hit him?" I said, "Well, I hit three great drives." And then he said, "Well, that's it, you dumb son of a bitch." He said, "You, just, <laughs> you said don't can't, you you can't miss the ocean, the Gulf of Mexico." So he said, "That's the kind of freedom you need in your swing," yeah. which is, has helped me a lot. I I got to save my own golf and in teaching. Yeah, that's I love that story, and I actually <laughs> did it. I had a, I did a YouTube tip on that years ago because I like <laughs> I thought that was so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, you come from such a great playing background, and there's. There's not as many, I guess, nowadays players that are turning into coaches. I mean, there's a few like Bradley Hughes. There's some guys that are mm-hmm. you know starting to starting to really switch it and and play you know play at a high level and then coach at a high level. How do you feel like that's influenced you? Because I know you you've got to spend time early in the early days. I kind of got off track a little bit there, but guys like Ken Venturi or 
you know, yeah. Harry, Harry Lighthorse Cooper, like talk a yeah. little bit about those guys and cause yeah. they were players, but they also sort of had that little teaching, you know, itch as well. Yeah. Well, eventually was the lead analyst for CBS for 35 years. And, uh, of course traveled the tour all the time, uh, as a commentator. But before that, he was a great player on the PGA tour in a short career. Uh, he turned professional after he was in the military at age 25. He had seriously considered staying in, as an amateur. Hmm. But, um, you know, he won 16 tour events, won the U.S. Open, and uh, was heavily influenced by his two mentors, Byron Nelson and, and Hogan, and played a ton with both of them. So you're just a great, uh, you know, a great guy for me to play with for 30 years. You know, I played a few hundred rounds with him, and Wow. Uh, I watched him work with Tom Watson and Weisskopf and, and John Cook. He worked with John Cook his whole, whole life, really. John Cook and I were uh, pallbearers at his, at his funeral. And uh, so I got to see a lot there. And then uh, I taught with Lighthurst Harry Cooper. A lot of people wouldn't know who that is, but he taught for 70 years until he died. And he uh, won 36 tour events. Uh, he's way, going way back, of course, yeah. way back to playing with... Bobby Jones and those guys, but he had great ideas on teaching. Um, and, you know, it was just somebody I was with at work all the time. So those are a few guys. Then Claude Harmon was right down the street. And when I was the pro at Tamarisk out in Rancho Mirage in California, uh, Mr. Harmon was right across the street at Morningside. So I used to go see him all the time. We had uh, lunch every week, talked to him a lot. And, he, you know, he was, again, a huge Hogan guy. He loved loved Hogan. And, you know, those those kind of guys, That's that was cr- you know, great to have a real close relationship with them. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I had, I mean, those influences are, they stand the test of time, even in today's teaching world. It's so cool to have, you know, that kind of background. And that's, I think, why you're so successful and you've evolved, you know, obviously with the new technology nowadays, and then, you know, going back to how things have changed. Talk a little bit about how you've, how you've kept up with, the newer, the newer technology, what we can yep. measure and the information. And then, but I think, you know, what I, what I would say, and you probably would echo this is you probably learned a lot of that coming up. You just didn't really know exactly how to quantify it. Well, that's true. I think Jason, you in business, in any business, you keep up or you get run over, you, you reinvent yourself and you keep learning. And, uh, you know, I've, I've always, a big thing, you know, you've been down to my, my golf schools mm-hmm. and um, we've tried to be on the cutting edge of technology. I had the swing motion trainer way back when I wrote the X Factor where we had, you know, most of the tour go on that swing motion trainer, which was a gyroscope on your back and it would measure your shoulder turn versus your hip turn. So that was way back in the early 90s. And then I had biomechanics a little bit in the, in the mid 90s and then Dr. Rob Neal came to work for me in 2003. A lot of people know who Dr. Neal is, oh, one yeah. of the foremost biomechanics guys. And he worked for me for 11 years. So we we did all that biomechanics research, which was fantastic. Um, you know, to we got a lot of tour players on there. And then, of course, I've got to mention Carl Welty. He was you know, the greatest yeah. researcher I've ever known in my life. And we were research partners for 40 years, you know. And he just loved you know, he just loves studying the golf swing and, and, you know, I'm still really big on video. We've got body track and K vest and all the things, but I really feel like I can do the the most with uh, the video. Yeah. He, he had, I guess, arguably the largest library of, of golf swings yeah, I ever, don't think right? Any argument about it. Yeah. 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 Uh, Amazing guy. Was, I wish I would have met yeah. him. Talk a little bit yeah. about him and how you, yeah, and I, that was one of my questions is how, how valuable do you think 2D video is nowadays? Because I yeah. still think we all use it. I mean, even I use it with TrackMan you know, and, and mm-hmm. everything else. I mean, Oh, yeah, I didn't mention TrackMan, of course. I, yeah. I, I own 12 of them. You know, they're, they're <laughs> just a big deal for us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's great stuff. I, I love the love technology. But, yeah, just a little bit on Carl Welty. Um, when I, he, he grew up at, in San Diego, La Jolla, working for Paul Runyon as a young guy and um he came up with Runyon when Paul Runyon opened Sahali in Seattle and then he took a job um very close within a mile of the where I grew up on the golf course I grew up 
and I was winning a lot of amateur events and uh, tournaments in the Northwest, and he and he contacted me about putting me on it's it was eight millimeter <laughs> back then <laughs> wow, yeah. and you know he had to wait wait a couple of weeks to get it but he also had a sequence camera which uh, ben doyle always you know used mm-hmm. as, uh it's a really cool camera where you the picture would slide out took a minute for it to to produce but it had eight pictures on it and there was a little dial on the side where you could dial it to the speed of the swing of the person you're watching and you know, all swings are have a little bit of different pace. They all come in at pretty close to one second, you know, of, of time. But it could be mm-hmm. 0. 0.8, 0. 0.9, 0. 0.1. You got pretty good at using that little dial so you could get the backswing and downswing. But Carl used that on me, and and then we got that relationship started. <clears throat> and I was always something, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I always was very interested in the mechanics of the golf swing. I did quite a bit of stuff with uh, Ben Doyle who who really brought the golf machine out which you see a lot of guys teaching right now right. Six, 60 years later. Oh yeah. And I went to Homer Kelly's house. I was going to say didn't My you dad, didn't you grow up right around the corner from him? Yeah, yeah, very close. Uh, yeah. I went to Homer's house and spent a whole afternoon with him in, the, oh in his gosh. garage with all the stuff and and then I played with Ben and um later on after my teacher uh, was his name was Al Mingert who's a really fine player that's who i worked with when i was younger and my dad but um carl though had this unbelievable interest and uh, determination to study golf swings and he ended up running the school a little later at la costa his golf school which we had the tournament of champions there and i would go out for a week or 10 days with him every year out there and we would film all the players, and it was so easy. You could film during the tournament, yeah. you know, and nobody cared. And uh, all the great players, you know, all the tournament champion guys were there. And uh, and then later they had the senior tournament of champions too. But Carl and I would do this study where we t- try and see <clears throat> what were the common denominators of the guys who had won at least two majors. That's how we did it. Hmm. So that was about 16 or 17 guys, and we would – Study and well, I'll tell you, Jason, it was so hard to find anything yeah. that they all did, and that's what really the quest. You know, we started on way, way back, and um, you know, to develop the research. And Carl was just maniacal about putting the camera in certain locations. That you had to do everything exactly right. He would yell at me if I didn't have anything <laughs> off. <laughs> but you know, that's what I've done with my teachers, and uh, we we uh, have. You know, being at Doral for 26 years, 25 of those years we had the, the tour event, we, we had access to filming everybody. Right. Also, I was at PGA West for 17 years with the tour event there, so it was very easy to get a lot of video. Is that is that when you started filming on the on the target line? Because I thought that was kind of oh, yeah. interesting. That's the first time I've ever seen anybody do that. And, yeah, I, and yeah, I don't, I don't Carl, think yeah. – yeah, I think yeah. I don't think there's – you know, I think that from top teachers, we'd all agree, like, just put it – in the same place every time. So it's consistent. Right. But I thought that was interesting. You guys were, you know, you'd pick that palm tree at the end of the range and you'd point it at it. And he's like, this is, yeah. this is, you know, but you, you understand what the swing should look like if it's there. And, and it's also good for students send you, send you videos and the camera angles off. You can kind of understand like where it is and why the swing yeah, looks we, different. We do. Well, we do a lot of research. I just had my staff, all the young guys that work for us right now to, do a test to put the camera in all different spots to see how different it is, you know. And sure. They're pretty shocked to how how much you can make a swing change just by moving the camera. Oh yeah, but I know we've got one commonality, and that's that our that our sons play college golf, and I know both of your oh, boys played right. played at a high level. So I was kind of curious again because yeah. I'm going to jump all over the place if you don't <laughs> mind here, but this is kind of what I do. But I'm I'm cur- I'm interested in the, their evolution coming up because I, I my son just went to college he's a freshman at Tennessee Tech and hey. I I still coach him but I was wondering sort of how you handled that coming up did you let somebody else coach them or if you coached them what are some tips that maybe <laughs> could help me <laughs> Well there got to be a certain time when uh, of course I love playing with the boys I'm sure like you did and as we, they mm-hmm. grew up and caddying for them in the tournaments junior tournaments and uh, taking him to a lot of tournaments it was a you know super highlight of, of my life, um, and we I played with him a lot. Uh, 
it got to be a point where if I said something to the to them during the round, it ruined it ruined the day. <laughs> sure. So uh, I had to be very careful because it's tough as the father to uh, be the teacher. I I see, and I know you do. So many players on the PGA Tour, it's overwhelming amount of, of guys out there who are taught by their fathers. Mm-hmm. JT. And sometimes you you let them let go and and move on. Now I had some really good guys that taught for me, so I would. Maybe if I had a suggestion, I'd say, hey, maybe look at this. But it was a lot better when they told them or when they do a little work with them. <laughs> yeah. And I I would send them to to see some, you know, Butch Harmon worked with them. And, you know, whenever Butch was around or, or other guys, mm-hmm. um, of course, they, my younger son spent, uh, I think he lived with Carl for six months. My, and my other boy worked at uh, my Texas school, excuse me, my um, out in California with Carl too. So they had a lot of time with Carl Welty. Um, my oldest son, Matt played at Wake Forest. And right. He, he played with, uh, Bill Haas and Webb Simpson on mm-hmm. two great players. And, uh, then John played at Oklahoma state where he lived with Ricky Fowler That's and right. uh, Kevin, yeah. Kevin Tway were his roommates for a couple of years. And John tried to play for a long time. He's played a lot of all over the world, but he just didn't quite make it. He's, so he's uh, working for me right now at, uh, down here at the Biltmore. That's cool. So they're both they're both teaching a little bit, right? Yeah, Matt. Uh, Matt is at the concession over in Sarasota, great place. Mm-hmm. And he went up to Oakmont for two years and taught, and then he's um, goes up to Fisher's Island in New York in in the summertime for two months or so. But mostly he's over there in uh, Sarasota. That's so cool. I know you're so proud. Uh, well, yeah, you know it's. Uh, they followed in your it's footsteps. A, a you know, it's like, yeah, it's I don't big, know if that was the right move all the time, <laughs> but uh, they're smart guys. They thought of things they could have done. But you know, this business is um, it's a, it's a it's a challenging business. You got to be lucky in a lot of respects, like we've been, Jason, yes. to be at nice places and uh, get get a few breaks in your life, and and it, it can be a great life as a golf professional. No doubt. So so take us back a little bit in your career there, where you decided that you weren't going to play for a living because i thought i mean that's always fascinating because you were such a great player there had to be there had to be some heartache there you know or maybe some baggage that said hey man if i just gave it one more year or what was there a time where you said all right it's just it's time to start teaching and then how did that sort of yeah. spur you on to like you know start golf schools i mean that's a big big jump and i know you were at some private clubs and we can get into that as well but do you remember? Do you remember that? Is or am I bringing back some bad memories? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I've I've got regrets. You know, yeah, I made mistakes, sure. uh, big big time mistakes when I was younger. I I had a lot of opportunity. I I uh, you know I played with great players at Houston and, and uh, I, I you know I went to the tour school and I got sick one one year. I didn't really get I. I went to, to you the missed finals. by like two, right? Like you. Well, missed, I missed. You were... Then I missed the next year. We played eight rounds, oh and I missed gosh. by three shots. Oh my um, gosh! Uh, and uh, I was just so. It's hard to explain. I just so disappointed in myself. I put mm-hmm. a lot of pressure on myself. I had some sponsors from my club back in Seattle, guys who didn't have much money, and. Uh, it's a lot of pressure. I, isn't I it? was I was burned out. I think yeah. I over practiced for one thing, and I over partied for another thing, and <laughs> I. Uh, we all we all did I, that at that age. <laughs> yeah, I did a little too much, and um, I just needed a little break, really. And I went to see Jackie Burke in Houston, and uh, I got offered a great, a really great job. A guy I used to play with at River Oaks, uh, Don Mullins, who was in the real estate business, big time real estate, and he offered me a heck of a job. And uh, then I got offered a couple jobs up in New York uh, to teach, where Jackie said that would be a great place for you to go. And uh, that was a big decision for me, really. I contemplated it, but I, uh, he's, you know, I went to, I went up to Westchester Country Club. We had the tour event. We had 1,800 members and 45 yeah. holes of golf. And I went up there, and I didn't really know, I hadn't really taught at all. I, I think I knew quite a bit about the game, playing the game. And I just, took, almost, I just took a year off. I kind of didn't play that much, and uh, first time in my life. And, uh, you know, I went down to New York City, had a good time. I taught a ton. And uh, I, I found out that I really enjoyed it. I really yeah. enjoyed the teaching. 
that's yeah, like, gonna set me off. What, yeah. what, what were those early days like? I mean, because we all we all sort of sucked, yeah, at the beginning. Like it's you know, obviously yeah. you're probably just teaching them probably what you're working on and what you heard that's from what, you yeah. know, your coaches and like how did that? That's crazy. Did it? That's an early. Yeah, I was gonna say that's that, an early teacher. Okay. <laughs> the the uh, the other thing I was saying, just thinking about when you were talking about that and the pressure of it's not normal when you room with you know four guys or three or four guys that all you know, t- tend to get to get to the tour really quickly, like Bruce Litsky and Rogers yeah. and John Mahaffey, like that, that couldn't have yeah. helped your, your uh, ego well, at all. Yeah, <laughs> You're I like, what's it, my, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. Well, yeah what, what am I doing wrong here? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, but it's, it's just, it really made me understand the mental part of the game and the management part of your life. Uh, as a teacher, the things that I really messed up on, because it's one thing to be able to hit the ball good and have a good short game, but it's those other two components. uh, As we know, being a better player, the mental game becomes more than 25%. You know, I kind of gave those four equal areas. Yeah. Uh, But once you're good at, you know, at at, at sort of the fundamentals of playing, of hitting shots, then the mental game is what really separates – guys who can play at a very high level, the PGA tour or the LPGA tour. Yeah, there's no doubt. So, so, so take us through when you decided to like open up a golf school. Cause that is like a huge commitment. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been in the golf school. I was in the golf school business you know, with Dana for 11 years. Mm-hmm. And I just know how difficult it is to be. I didn't want to be her when I was working for her <laughs> and to, you know, to, to manage a bunch of weirdos like us so that were, you know, trying to teach a thousand hours and, and do this stuff. Like, Talk us through that, that from a business side. How did that happen? Well, I I, uh, went, I ended up beca- becoming a head professional at, a, at some really nice places in New York, uh, and first with, at Sunningdale, and and then the Quaker Ridge, and then I did Quaker Ridge and Tamarisk, which is down in in uh, Rancho Mirage, California, and then from there uh, I was offered the job at Sleepy Hollow, which is just a fantastic place. Uh, it's hard to imagine what it, what this facility is like and we had a senior tour event at the time um after i was there for six years i got a call that uh, from doral and the owners wanted me to uh, come down and take over the golf school jimmy ballard was leaving oh, okay I and see. Uh, so i did sleepy and, and doral for two years and then i saw that this golf school allowed me to run my own business um, and, you know, teach full time and also to move down to uh, Miami. Or, and uh, then I'd have the summers off with my boys, uh, which was, you know, the summers are so busy for us up in New York. And I was really worked on. Uh, I played a lot up there, too. But uh, just a big change in my life. I decided to do it. I talked to a few guys that, you know, Dennis Satisher was one I talked mm-hmm. to and. Nelson Long up in New York, a few other people I really respected, and they said, yeah, I think, you know, I was teaching quite a few tour players by this. But, you know, when you're at a private club, I, I, they were great to me, and they let me do a lot of outside teaching, but I was also traveling to tournaments, and, you know, you almost reach a limit there, like you can't overstep that bound right. as far as, you know, you got to keep the members first, you, mm-hmm. you know. Yep. Uh, so so that, was the, that was the changing point for me, and and then, of course, golf was just exploded in the 90s. Right. Tiger Woods come in, and the golf schools were just huge. Yeah, it, it was so. amazing. I started Dana's at 2000, and my gosh, the, the first five <laughs> years, I mean, we were packing in golf schools at 32, right. 32 people a weekend, <laughs> you know, like as much as we could get. And I know she had consulted a lot with you as far as, like, the business plan right. and how yeah. you guys, you know, worked your, worked your deal. I know you were a huge help to her. It's amazing you're, you you're still going with that, you know, because I think there was definitely with the, you know, the depression and how that sort of right. came out. I know that hurt hurt us a lot, and I think that sort of started the, our social media, you know, campaigns and and marketing yes. and starting to reach more people. Well, there's so much information out there, and there's you know when I built my super station down in Doral on the range, it was like the first thing, you know, it was new, and now there's so many people that have their own teaching bays, uh, their own teaching up north. Uh, where they can teach indoors during mm-hmm. the winter. Um, yeah, the depression, I mean, that's set golf back, and we're I think we're on a nice recovery path right now. For sure. 
Uh, the junior golf's going fabulous for us, um, and I know for you up there. So, um, yeah, we have, we went through some difficult times, and then I, I I still love doing the golf schools, and we still do quite a few. I, I do I do quite a few traveling schools, Jason, too, yeah. in the summer where, where I go places, and those those work well. Um, but I, I think people appreciate the one-on-one instruction uh, probably the most. I think that's the yeah. cornerstone of our teaching. <laughs> However, when you have people for three days, and you've done the golf schools a long yeah. time, you get a chance to work with them on their bunker game, different types of bunker shots, flop shots, putting, lag putting, a lot of things that people don't normally take a lesson in. It's pretty tough to get, you know, the, the putting lessons going or, or chipping and uh, the pitching. They're so fundamental to being a better player. So uh, there are some – and also the power in a group I think is, is very good. Yes. However, that being said, I think it's tougher to sell the golf schools now, a lot tougher than it used to be. Yeah, I would, I would say that's got to be the, the hard mm-hmm. part. Get, when you get them in there, it's definitely a, it's a cool vibe because you do start to build that relationship with that group, especially if you guys do it the way – like we we experimented a little bit with staying with the same group or you know going to different stations or you know there, there's a variety of way to, ways to do it. But I think it is kind of a cool deal when you can – build that relationship with them. It's tough, yeah, it's yeah. tough when get, they leave get, though, right? It's like, that's the yeah. thing It's like, you don't know what happens after they leave. That was the only thing. Well, it's a good me. thing and it's a bad thing. Jason, <laughs> you <know? laughs> exactly. When you're yeah. at the club, you know, you got the same people. All right. time gets, after, after for me, you know, after it got to be six years, sort of, you know, I, <laughs> I was kind of looking for that new challenge and, but, I, but ha- having somebody that you can have continuous time, because I still have a lot of people that come down to see me from New York. They've been coming down for a lot of years. So it is great to have a relationship and, and also to continue on a, on a good improvement path for somebody. And I think now in three days, what that we do is our m- most common school. I just try to give them an improvement plan that they can go back and, w- and continue to work on with their professional or teaching professional back home. Yeah, definitely. So let's, let's switch gears just for a second. Yeah, because I'm curious about this too. Is he, and you've written 15 books, I think. I'm probably maybe even leaving a few out, and I've, I think I've read every one of them. Cool. Um, talk, and I know you got a new one coming out. Is that right? Yeah, I was just working on it now with the publisher. I've yeah, managed, it's so tough. I I've been working on this book for about three years. I threw one away, which <laughs> is scary. And then I started again, and I, we're really at the finish line now, where. Um, it's going to go into to uh, press, and it comes out on May fifth. That's awesome. So that yeah. that was that was what I wanted to dig into a little bit because I, I back I think four or five years ago I'd written a book that was about ninety mm-hmm. percent finished, and then by the time I wanted to put it out, like I I hated it, and you know I was like, okay, <laughs> now I, I believe something else is like take take me through the process of like how you do the research, how it starts, you know, the ideas, just, mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just curious about the whole deal. Cause I know it's, 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 it's a lot of work and I, I'm, I can't believe how you've done that much work with as busy as you are anyways, but how does it start? Well, Jason, I've always liked writing. I, I minored in English at uh, Houston and I, I always have written down ideas uh, almost on a daily basis. It, even, a couple sentences, but um, yeah, this latest book um, is an offshoot of the Eight Step Swing book. I, I had the, a couple, two reprints of the Eight Step Swing book, which sold is sold pretty well. But it, it was a pretty comprehensive book on, on more than the golf swing. Mm-hmm. So I I have really uh, looked at teaching very carefully in my life, just as you have. And I've gone to see a lot of teachers, and I, especially uh, in my earlier years, where I really went to see a lot of teachers. And my deduction from this is the, is interesting how uh, confident some teachers are, uh, more the method teachers. Uh, they're supremely confident in, in what they're teaching, and that, that was always interesting to me. And I learned a lot from from them. Um, but I also would go to another method teacher who was having success with people, and they'd be teaching something almost the opposite. Mm-hmm. So, you know, trying to put all this together uh, with the eight-step swing, I came up with those uh, the idea of safety zones and trying right. to get it more corridors of, of success, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to trying to get a universal 
way of uh, explaining teachers. And then if all these teachers I've had work for me, I wanted to give them the opportunity to use their own genius, that they didn't just teach exactly what, like, to me, teaching exact positions is the easiest thing to do because you get really good at it and you got all the answers. You could, you could come up with everything. But um, with having these corridors to swing within and getting the matchups correct um, is what this new book is about. And, and I it. feel that every teacher that I've seen, even though they say they're not, they are position teachers. And I don't think there's anything better than showing people where they should be and giving them drills and ideas and visuals on how to do it. And then they leave knowing what they're trying to do. So I call this uh, Build Your Swing is the title, but the secondary title is Position Teaching in the Modern Age. Yeah, I remember, I'll I'll let you continue there. Just again, remember, remember, (laughs) (laughs) remember, uh, we both spoke, this has been several years ago at the PGA show at the V1 booth. And I, right. I was watching you, and it, you said, you can say you're not a position teacher, but if you're using video, <laughs> you are a position teacher. Because, like, what Where are, are you going to stop the camera? Right. I mean, what exactly. are you going to look at? What are you looking at, right? So I think mm-hmm. that's that's brilliant. So it's, And you, you mentioned something else, which is matchups, and that's sort of the buzzword now of, yeah. you know, of coaching and teaching. Yeah, it's just, you know, it, it's evolving, but I think – method gets thrown around a lot but system or i I use the word framework more than Mm -hmm. anything is it has a lot of leeway right with different players as we know to me it's got to come to this eventually you know it's surprising to me how long it's taken but um you just have to look at the top 10 players in the world and you see 10 different positions at the top sure there's the you know the back swing is different. Uh, the, the, I think the body movements become closer, but they're not all the same either. Right. But you have to know like where do you go off? Like at w- what point are you doing too much of something? Um, and then as you said, the I think the buzzwords of matchups now is is a lot more prevalent. I think we all thought about that in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, all teachers um, that were good teachers would know from strong grips and closed club face that you needed more rotation in the golf swing. And right. there's definitely to me, the uh, two different types of releases, I mean, opposite types of releases. So there's all, there's all in between. So my thing in teaching is am I trying to get more lag or am I trying to get more throw in the, in whoever's swing mm-hmm. with most people, amateurs, we're trying to get more lag in the swing sure. and more compression in, on the hit. But there's there's guys that you know I could go right with Tiger Woods or, or Patrick Reed you know have phenomenal fast releases and, and really let the club go kind of the classic swing and then you've got guys trying to square the club face up and there's the idea is no rotation or minimal rotation of the club face and squaring it up with the rotation of your body mm-hmm. but they're both work there's guys yeah. in the Hall of Fame on doing it both ways well and that's where the the coach comes in right like the the, yes. the in the cracks stuff that I'd say that yes. you've got to be you know the coach has to have that diagnosis and the prescription mm-hmm. for that particular player that's in front of you and that's you know that's not easy that's not easy to do I don't think that there's nothing but experience and sort of failing and, and succeeding that train that uh, I agree completely I, I think we can get better a lot faster than Carl Welty and I did way back when we were yeah. trying to figure everything out. And uh, you're pro- my thing, uh, Jason, was going to see all these different teachers and, you know, the different ideas, uh, especially when we didn't have all the biomechanics and track man stuff and, and all the uh, technology that we have now. You, you're trying to figure out, well, is Jimmy Ballard right? Or yeah. is, is uh, the golf machine, the way the golf machine was taught by 99% of the guys was, you know, a lot of, uh, lag, drag, w- w- which uh, Ben Doyle was great at teaching, and and uh, a few others, you know, that have, M- Mac O'Grady. Yeah. So that's that's good stuff. Dragging, dragging and the then, handle, uh, <laughs> and now it's like that's like yeah, a big I faux mean, pas. It, now it's like it, there's got to be there's got to be a little bit of a blend in there somewhere. I think so. I mean, it, it, there's no one way for everybody. Um, you got to l- look at the head that's on to how they see things, how they visualize right. things, how athletic they are, how much natural speed they have. Speeds become, uh, to me, that was the number one thing that Carl Welty, we always talked about way back was speed. He met, we, he had a speed machine 
And a lot of his vi- his video ideas came from a guy named Bill Glasson, who was this uh, president of uh, Hughes Missile, and a genius. He yeah. graduated number one out of Caltech, which is MIT. And um, he, he gave Carl a lot of good ideas on video. For, for example, going down the target line, so you could see the start line on the golf ball. And there's a bunch of other reasons, but and how far back the camera had to be. Bill Glasson was a, a lot of help to Carl way back when. But, you know, trying to put all this stuff together, like wh- what's, uh, what's correct? You know, what's the right yeah. thing to do? Yeah. You're talking about Bill Glasson that played the tour? Same guy no. or different guy? No, no. Yeah, I was going to say that. Guy. Yeah, I was going to well, say Bill that. Bill was that, a heck of a player. That you know, guy he was, was a smart a guy, but I don't think he was quite at a, a 200 <laughs> IQ. That, uh, <laughs> Bill, this other Bill Glasson right, was I'm, a genius. I'm with yeah. you. That's awesome. So, so um, I've got. It's somebody. not good to be a genius as a golfer. <laughs> I you know? think you're right. <laughs> uh, it was such an honor last year at that proponent group to sit on the, the panel with you and, and David Ledbetter. We were talking about mentoring. And sort of before we move on to like helping other coaches, and this is a good segue is I know, you know, you've had so many and you can give me the number of like young coaches that have turned into great teachers that you've had under your tutelage. Uh, So talk about the importance of mentoring and and like paying it forward. And is, is that something that was sort of innate or do you feel like that just sort of did it evolve over over time? I think it was kind of innate. My my dad yeah had a lot of great ideas working at Boeing aircraft with this sharing of ideas with the, the people, the engineers he worked with. And he was very influential in that. And, you know, as a head professional, I, I was pretty big on the staff meetings and, it, you know, was, I just think it's something I've loved to do is teaching the teachers. Um, we've had these, <clears throat> we started having those Monday meetings right away at, yeah. at Doral and I've had, I'd like to have you come down. I've had a lot of I would love uh, that. Really top. I mean, a lot of top guest uh, instructors come just down. Just tell me when. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you tell me when. Because <laughs> you can come down anytime. Mm-hmm. Every Monday, every mm-hmm. Monday morning, we do them. It's great. So, uh, it's a, it's ninety minutes, and it's mostly research. And uh, pe- the the guys have to get up and speak. Sure. They have to get up and talk about uh, a driving presentation, a, an iron presentation, bunker presentation, an opening presentation to a school an opening presentation to a clinic. I think that's helped a lot of these guys when they've gone to their clubs. And we've, we had our list. We did a little get together at the golf show and we had 265 guys and girls that are now directors of instruction or, or head professionals at, at clubs. So amazing. that's been a great thing for me. I, I there, it's part of our family uh, of people that have, you know, they become, you know, you keep a little distance, but they're great, great friends of mine. Yeah. In case you had to fire somebody. But, <laughs> <laughs> no. um, but just it. kidding. <laughs> we, we just, uh, you know, we had some stern talks over the years with some. And, and, you know, we have to, it's a big give and take at our at our golf school. that I want them to come in and tell them anything they see that we need to be doing better, anything that's not right in teaching. We go through the latest things that we're watching on Instagram, watching your stuff, looking at what's going oh, on, you know, and it's, 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 it's pretty, I'm scared. It's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> oh, no, you don't need to be scared. You're doing great. You're doing great work, Casey. Yeah. And that, and that talk we did uh, on mentoring was, uh, was really fun, you know, to listen to everyone, you know, the guys talk. We had a nice group of people there. So that was, that was interesting. Well, yeah, it's just the older I get, it's just, you know, you want to, I mean, again, it's just, I guess it's just being a good human, but you want to leave the, you want to leave the teaching game better than you found it. Right. And all the people that we've helped help us along the way, mm-hmm. you know, you want to, you want to pay that forward. And I think it's just, I always talk about leaving a legacy and like, I just hope to leave half of a legacy that you've left with the people that have worked for you. Cause it's, it's just, just it's amazing to me. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been that, uh, team effort and i credit them in these books i've written too of doing these studies together we do really in-depth studies every year we um for quite a few years we've been taking the top 100 players in the world and and, uh, look at everything they're doing you know how many guys lift their left heel uh what does the head do in the golf swing how much does it move which direction does it move uh what's the left knee doing what's the relationship between the left knee and the hip and you know when we get 35 or 40 of these studies done uh, each year, you know, it really 
you know, keeps you up to date with what's going on and see if there's anything, you know, anything changing in, in golf and the golf swings. And, you know, I've really, that's been something I've just had this immense interest in doing since I had that early introduction from Carl Welty back in Seattle. And then, you know, he worked for me for 17 years at PGA net. Uh, PGA West in California too. So, whenever I was out there, I, I had a uh, I spent quite a bit of time out of PGA West for a lot of years, and I just would go over to Carl's house every night, and we just study the, that video. Man, it was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I was like, where does yeah. that where does that come from? Like, I mean, I, I don't know. You can't. I don't think you can give that to somebody. It just has to be in there. And I, and I, and I always say because I get that question a lot when I'm on the other side of the podcast is, I just think wh- whatever we would have decided to do, we would have been the same way, you know, in our careers. We'd have, we would have tried to go on the nth degree to figure out the answers and to be problem solvers. Yeah, if I went back to Jackie Burke, it went, you know, I spent so much time at Champions. I just was there last month and, and uh, spent a, a day with him. But early on, you know, Jackie would take me through Champions, how he ran the facility, <laughs> and the detail was unreal. And when he sent me up to New York, he helped me get the job there at Westchester he said, you know, if you're going to do this teaching, you got to do it like you're getting prepared for the U.S. Open to, to win the U.S. Open. He said, you got to be good at everything. I, like I want it. you to come back here and tell me everything about running a golf operation. I want you to sit down in front of Jimmy Demerit and me and tell us everything about golf. And, you know, he was a tough I mean, wow. he is a tough guy. He's a uh, was in the Marines for four years and it, he grew up in a tough, tough time. And, uh, he was just so great to, to me as mentoring me in beyond golf. For yeah. Sure. So what are, you know, now with all the new technology, the new information that's come out now, we know exactly, we know what the club's doing. We understand the forces and torques. You know, we understand what, what's happening with the ground. Share with the listeners, what are the few things that you've learned maybe in the last five, ten years that you didn't know before? How how has your teaching changed? I guess that, that's a good, how's it yeah. evolved. Um, well, I I think having the you know the biomechanics for a long time and the, the going way back to that sports motion trainer to watch watching how the body moves and just the hours and hours and thousands of lessons you give of of watching how things happen and how you relate to a student and how you how you teach them i think that the uh, track man for example um is better than biomechanics um, the biomechanics when when we put up the graphs and all the information can be a bit overwhelming and it's a lot of great stuff for the teacher to know but sure. you got to be really careful of how much information you give a person when do you dispense the information? How do you spoon feed it out? As opposed to giving him too many things, which a lot I see a lot of people that come down, Jason, are so confused and they're just right. so tense with their body and they just forgot how to swing a golf club again. But I think putting that track man stuff up is really interesting for a lot of people. There's all the all the different uh, twenty seven parameters we have now are are, are, are fantastic. And certainly if you slow things down a little bit on on uh, the body track and or other force plates you use, and definitely with K vest and things like that, um, of course, Dr. Neal's ADM stuff is is. But you got to hook the person up. There's there's a little bit of time to that, and sometimes, you know, I kind of want to get in there and teach and get this person right. going. Yeah. It depends, you know, but if you have somebody that's coming back to you over and over and again, man, I think that it becomes better yeah. when you have a, a, a long, long time student where you can, you know, really get time to have them understand more of the biomechanics of the swing. Yeah. I guess, let me, let me see if I can phrase that question a little bit better. Yeah. That was a little vague, but it, it's more the stuff that we're mm-hmm. learning. Like, like for example, I had my training session today with my staff and one of my, one of my, coaches went to Dr. Kwan's certification, right. which was fantastic, right? So right. he brought the information back and we talked about it and it it basically validated a lot of the stuff that we were teaching, but now we know why. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, is there anything new that you've learned like in the last five years of whatever it is, 
And then obviously the, the difference is what you're explaining is more how you're going to deliver that to the student, which would be dumbed down and, you know, the other stuff. But like just from just from you, like I'm always curious that, you know, guys that have been around the business so long and you've seen the evolution of everything that we've gone through with teaching. Is there anything that like what 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 part of it has been probably the most eye opening for you? <clears throat> Well, I think the explanations of how you say things has improved. It's getting yeah. more medical terms, more yes. correct than That's I used to point. say. Yeah, you, you know, and I, I had things like Venturi had a couple of. Well, I'm going to just tell you one thing. Or, yeah. what, from the top of the downswing, he would he would say, "I want your left shoulder to leave your chin mm-hmm. and move, and so you move your chest up on top of the ball instead of." dropping the right side under too yeah, much right too much so right then, bend. yeah so then you know when you see it now it's explained more with the rib cage sliding to the, the, toward the target right, center of mass as right? you start <laughs> down well you said that this is your upper center yeah, mass, yeah though, right yeah this is the upper center sure and and how it moves which i think is a, a better explanation uh i think i'm pretty good at showing that to bunch of the guys I've worked with tour players it's a more high level thing mm-hmm. uh, and there's a lot of times when I'm teaching the opposite you know with the, the people that are coming over the top you're getting them to drop their right shoulder under and drop you know get the elbow down and right. the magic move of Harvey Pennick you know and yeah. it's, that's really good but in a top golfer that's that's the mistake I see with club pros and better amateur golfers and, and on PGA tour players and I think the explanations are are vastly improved and uh as long as you you can relate that the student can understand what you're saying jason I, I think we're getting better at the at the explanations of it as far as learning things i mean you, if you look at track band of all the different things there the windows that you have to hit out and i think what you see in track man i wrote a book on the track man with uh, adam koloff too i think you know adam he's fantastic I do. yep and uh but we did it with parameters there, and and you find out that you know you don't there's it's not exactly the same for for the best players in the world. I've had really interesting conversations with Ryan Moore and Dustin Johnson, and and when I worked Gary Woodland, I think the track man helped me a lot because Woodland was hitting a lot down I'm on the sure. golf ball. I'm sure. Yeah, I was gonna it. say yeah. And Angle of attack is a difficult thing to so, to see, right, with your naked eye. Yeah, so you know you <laughs> could tell somebody that, but when it comes up there on the screen. And they go, oh, my God, I am hitting down on it. Um, that's a lot better than Jim McLean telling them, you know, Gary, I think you're hitting down on the ball too much. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's right. It, and then why, when do you hit down on the ball? So, so there's times, you know, in a ground of golf, you know, it's not the same swing all the way around. You're, you're sure. playing some cuts and fades and lower trajectory shots, and you ch- so that angle of check changes. Plus... Uh, Jason, I think this is really important to, to all teachers who might be listening to this, is where the wind conditions that you put the track man on have a tremendous uh, difference uh, in, in the numbers you're going to get. Do you do you tend to switch the normalized feature to yeah. where that player is going to play? Yeah, I do that a lot. It's yeah. like, I think yeah, that's a huge, fe- a huge feature where they're going to go but, to different different altitudes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. And, uh, of course, the track man's great for distance control and using the combine and all, yeah. all the things that we're able to do. So that's, to me, been a, a, a great um, upward trend in, in golf. It's been around quite a while now, but it's. I think the launch monitors are really good. Yeah, now we now we know you know, that you were correct when you, we talked about face override years ago, right? <laughs> People thought the path was the start direction. Like we had it all down it all backwards. That's when I came up. Through so the that's PGA. really interesting because <laughs> I had, I had, I know, you know, Frederick Tuxton, right? Yeah. From, oh yeah. From, Absolutely. Uh, so Frederick came to Doral, I don't know, 12 years ago or something. We were talking about the initial direction that the ball goes on. So I've had a lot of conversa- good conversations with my dad on this and, uh, ben Doyle and, and Homer Kelly. I talked to them both about what happens when you hit the golf ball. And in the golf machine, they talk about how the club face is closing down on the ball, and there's a time when the ball's on the club face, and it's its separation, Point of separation that yep. is the most important time. But Frederick said, and a lot of other people say, it's when you make contact 
right at contact. Mm-hmm. So we, I remember we had that discussion, and I've had it with Wally Uline too, of some odd things I've noticed in on how a ball starts out. So it turns out that you know, like eight or ten years later, they've put that in there. Now it doesn't. I think it has only six percent uh, f- factor, but face rotation does have a factor in it and and, uh-huh. and that's been a fairly new thing with uh trackman i guess i don't sure with other launch monitors because i use trackman but i think yeah. it's probably all of them yeah and that i mean nothing is nothing happens without center contact <laughs> but another interesting thing that i've so i yeah. saw that uh, i've read and I, you could probably verify for me that the guy that had the least amount of face rotation uh, had the most square club face was Luke Donald, who also had one of the fastest releases. Yeah. Uh, you have to, why don't you look that one up? Yeah, well, that, that that's interesting. Sounds wrong, doesn't it? it? That does sound wrong. That sounds completely backwards. Well, call me tomorrow. <laughs> I know you're gonna. I know you're yeah, gonna find out. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. We I've been spending a lot of time with uh, Tyler Farrell or just yeah certification, and I had him on the podcast, and we were talking about just a simple and you'll appreciate this because we did like me and my staff did a little 2d video research project of the best drivers on tour and the worst drivers on tour so we took so we took the word we did the worst driver the top top five drivers and the worst worst five drivers and one of the biggest differences was the timing that the trail arm straightened Mm-hmm. Right. And Luke yeah, Donald. Yeah. So the earlier the trail arm straight and the worse the driver was because what happened, because what happens is, you know, of course, the pivot has to stall and they got to flip it. Right. Like a Phil Mickelson or, you know, Luke Donald was kind of in that category. And then the least or the, the latest that the trail arm straightened, like a Dustin Johnson or Tommy Fleetwood or, you know, some mm-hmm. of these guys you would consider really good drivers there. You know, they had that sort of look where the. You know, there's a lot more differences in what the body's doing. Obviously, there's a lot more into it. Face rotation, face position, but it was just an interesting that you brought that yeah, up. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of stuff you need to be doing right there. That, yeah. uh, that's a great study, and uh, I'm going to look into that one. You gave me good, good something to work <laughs> on. There you go. So, so well, I probably I probably have to jump here pretty soon. Okay, I'm, yeah. So we go five couple, minutes. Couple more, okay? yeah. A couple more questions here. Yeah, let's give one for the for the younger coaches, then I'll wrap up with a with a final question. I appreciate your time, but a lot of young coaches listening to this podcast. So you know, as a guy that's been in the business and, and done a lot, what would be the advice you would give the PGM student or the young coach that says he wants to get into teaching and get better at his, his or improve his teaching skills. Try, try to go see the best people in the business. Go, go see the people that you uh, admire. Uh, try to go see some different teachers, get a different uh, look at, at uh, how they're teaching and what they're saying, because you learn something. If you don't even, if you don't agree almost with anything from a, a well-known teacher, you're going to learn something. It may not, it may be what you don't want to do, but yeah, I think you can always learn from going to visit. It's much easier now because you can go to Instagram, but it's still a quick shot. It's not sure. quite like going to spend time with somebody. If somebody comes to you for a full day or takes a lesson from you, in fact, that's what I do now because I get a lot of people that want to come down and watch me teach, mm-hmm. and, I, and I don't do that because I've got so many guys that work for me. Uh, we've got 16 teachers here and, and seven assistants, and a lot of those assistants are coming to watch me teach. And it's uncomfortable for the student, you know, to have pros hovering over them. It's 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 an uncomfortable thing. So mm-hmm. I always tell them, look, if you want to come, I'll give you a great deal. I'll give them a great deal on the price, whatever they can afford. Mm-hmm. I'll give them a lesson. They'll learn a lot more that way. But I don't do the, uh, well, although I've made an exception once in a while, but uh, the the coming down and watching deal. Yeah, I, I remember when you, this is again back to the original workshop i remember when you introduced jason carbone which is now a good friend of mine you said he's yeah. probably taken lessons from more of the top 100 coaches on the list than anybody and i thought that was really that just stuck yeah. with me pretty cool pretty cool way to observe but also get in the frame of that student mentality which i think is super valuable i do too yeah well jason's a great great friend of mine and he's a he's a fantastic teacher and he's uh, he's helped a lot of people, and they're just leaving Baltus Roll now to go back back home to uh, I know. the family. Yeah, yeah. 
All right. So last, last and final question. Everybody has to answer this question and I appreciate your time. We, I think we need to do a, a part two cause I've got so much more okay. that I want to talk about, but I, I, I will take what I can get. Uh, if you had to get a message to the world, to billions of people and put it on a gigantic billboard, what would your billboard say and why? Wow. And that's, that's just too big a question. <laughs> And you can yeah, have no, multiple, that, multiple that would, billboards. <laughs> <laughs> that would, uh, that's, you know, that's world, uh, that's a world question. I, I don't really I don't know how to answer that one. You know, but we'd say world peace or something <laughs> like that, you know. Uh, is there it would a favorite, be a lot, it'd be a lot bigger than golf. Is there a favorite quote or any, or like a mantra that you live by? Anything that yeah. like maybe jumps out at you you can give us? <laughs> well, Henry Ford said, Nothing is difficult if, if you can put it into small enough steps. And that's kind of how I've tried to teach. Love it. The building block approach. I'm a big fan the of The building block. Yep. There you go. This is called, yep. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me on, Jason. Absolutely. I admire what you're doing and uh, congratulations on uh, all of your success. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate your time. It, it, do you want to give out any of your platforms, social, or your website? Oh, well, yeah. We just jimmcclain.com. And you can get me there. And this, this new book is. Come, it's on Amazon right now. A pre-sale comes out May 5th. It's called Build Your Swing. Um, you can go to Amazon and take a look at that. Awesome. Thank you so much, and I Thank appreciate you. everything you've done, and uh, I will hope to talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, Jason. Right. Adios. What's up, everybody? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you go. Uh, thank you so much for listening and subscribing to the podcast. I appreciate the support. Uh, first, big thank you to Jim for coming on the show and taking the time to share his incredible knowledge about teaching and life that I know will help you all become better coaches. Uh, make sure you follow Jim on the gram and Twitter at McLean Golf and give him a social wave and say thank you for taking the time. Also check out his website at jimmcclain.com. Uh, thank you again to our sponsors, envyedhemp.com. And make sure you use the promo code GURU20 for that 20% discount. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I appreciate that. So you can DM me at Golf Guru TV. That's at Golf Guru TV. Love to get those followers up on Instagram as I'm sharing a lot of sort of behind the scenes from my teaching. And if you want to work with me and you're not a member at Carmel, make sure you go download the app. The Golf Guru app is available on Apple and it's really cheap under $20 a month, uh, $100 a year. So go check that out. I've got lots of videos and again, a Facebook feed that is really including a lot of the stuff that I do on a daily basis is working with my players. Uh, you can also check out my website at golfgurutv.net where you can find videos, articles, and more information on my teaching and coaching. Uh, if you have a question and you don't want to hit me up on the DM, Email the show at golfgurushow at gmail.com. Music is by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And as I always leave you with, make sure you study, make sure you practice, and make sure you teach, and then ultimately pass it on. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much for listening.